The FIFA World Cup is one of the most recognizable sports contests in the entire world. Every four years, fans from all around the world come together to cheer on their national teams and watch some of the greatest players in the world battle it out for the chance to be named World Cup champions. This is the FIFA World Cup iceberg. It outlines some of the most memorable and obscure moments that have occurred throughout World Cup history. Side note before we start, I'm going to be skipping the first tier of this iceberg. Most of the information in the first tier is common knowledge for anyone who knows a thing or two about the beautiful game. And even if you don't, most of these entries are either things you can easily guess or find loads of information online. And this iceberg is already long enough that we don't really need to cover it. If you are interested, I'll leave a link to the iceberg in the description below so you can do some research on your own time. With that being said, let's jump into the FIFA World Cup iceberg. Zidane Headbutt France and Italy met in the 2006 World Cup Final in a battle between two of the better European squads of the decade. After an opening 20 minutes that saw France's Zinedine Zidane score a penalty kick and Italy's Marco Materazzi score a header from a corner, both teams were deadlocked after a grueling 90 minutes and went into extra time. With around 10 minutes left in extra time, Zidane and Materazzi were walking back from an Italian clearance when Materazzi allegedly made a comment about Zidane's sister which enraged Zidane and resulted in him headbutting Materazzi directly in the chest. After initial confusion about what had occurred, Zidane received a red card and Italy went on to win their fourth World Cup in a 5-3 penalty shootout. This was Zidane's final match for the French national team as he had come out of retirement one last time for this tournament. Ronaldo and Nike 1998 Brazil were the heavy favorites going into the 1998 World Cup and for good reason. Brazil held the previous title from 1994 and had been the only team to ever win the World Cup on a different continent. On the night before the final against a hungry France side who also happened to be the host nation, Brazilian striker Ronaldo suffered a convulsive fit and was deemed unable to play by medical doctors, but was put back into the starting lineup for the game an hour before kickoff. Brazil would go on to lose the final 3-0, with Ronaldo having a particularly poor performance and suffering an injury. Many conspiracies surrounding Ronaldo's inclusion into the lineup came about, mostly centering around Nike's involvement with the Brazilian national team. Not only was Nike the main sponsor of Brazil, Ronaldo was also their poster boy. Conspiracists believed that Nike couldn't let their star sit out in the biggest game of the tournament, so they essentially threatened to pull out of their sponsorship deal with Brazil if Ronaldo didn't play. Jules Rimet Trophy Story the Jules Rimet Trophy was the original trophy given to the World Cup winner from 1930 to 1970 in honor of then-serving FIFA president Jules Rimet. The trophy has an interesting history when it comes to theft. In 1938, the trophy was given to Italy, but due to Nazi control in the region, it had to be smuggled out in a shoebox to prevent Nazis from taking it. It has also been stolen multiple times, first in 1966 for seven days before it was found by a dog in a garden, and second in 1983 when four thieves stole it from display in Brazil's footballing headquarters. The trophy has yet to be fully recovered from this theft, with only the original base being located. Bebeto Celebration On July 7, 1994, Brazilian striker Bebeto and his wife welcomed their child Mateus into the world in the middle of the 1994 World Cup. Two days later, in a quarterfinal match with the Netherlands, Bebeto scored his second goal of the match ran to the sideline and started a cradling celebration in honor of his newborn son. Today it remains one of the most iconic World Cup celebrations in the rage of every FIFA player after conceding. Tiki Taka Tiki Taka refers to a style of football where players make short passes and movements to carry the ball around. A major focus of Tiki Taka is placed on possession and working through various possession channels, which can often be seen in the triangular shape players position themselves in. It received international recognition after Spain utilized the system during the 2010 World Cup and 2008 and 2012 Euros, winning all three titles. Vuvuzela The Vuvuzela is a horn-like instrument that was an international craze during the 2010 World Cup in South Africa. Some controversies arose due to the pitch and volume that a Vuvuzela creates. For reference, it sounds like this. Obviously, with many fans hopping onto the Vuvuzela bandwagon, the collective noise of the Vuvuzela sometimes made it difficult for players and coaching staff to communicate on the pitch, and would cause some hearing loss for some fans. The Hand of God 
The Hand of God goal is a pretty well-known goal scored by Diego Maradona against England in the quarterfinals of the 1986 World Cup. Basically, an English midfielder cleared the ball back to England goalkeeper Peter Shilton, but while Shilton went to grab it, Maradona contested the ball by punching it in the air before Shilton could grab the ball, and the ball rolled into the goal. Both the center referee and the linesman believed it was a goal, much to the dismay of the English, primarily because there was no video replay available to show Maradona's infraction. Argentina would go on to win the match 2-1 due to Maradona's second goal of the match, known as the goal of the century, but obviously, much controversy arose from the hand of God and Maradona's subsequent media comments about the goal. Miroslav Klose Goal Record Miroslav Klose is a former German striker who owns the record for the most goals in World Cup history at 16, which spans the four World Cups from 2002 to 2014. To give you an idea of how hard this record is to surpass, the current highest active goal scorer is Thomas Müller at 10 goals over three World Cups, while players like Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi have seven and six goals over four World Cups, respectively. Clockwork Orange in Total Football Total football is a term used to describe a style of football where all outfield players can fluidly play all positions, thus allowing for a wider array of tactics to be utilized to counter an opponent's best players. The Clockwork Orange refers to the team that introduced this style of play. The 1970 and 74 Dutch national teams headlined by none other than Johan Cruyff. The name comes from the media and other onlookers, who described watching the team work as mechanical and like a clock. Since then, teams have tried, and failed, to adapt to this style, with the closest being the Tiki Taka of Spain. Banks Wonder Save In the 1970 World Cup group stage match between England and Brazil, England goalkeeper Gordon Banks pulled off an amazing save to deny a downward header from Pele to keep the game tied at 0-0. It's honestly up there as one of, if not the best save in all of footballing history, not just the World Cup alone. Pele has cited the save as being the best he's ever seen, saying to Banks afterwards, I thought that was a goal, said Banks in response, you and me both. Golden Goal Many fans of the game know about the Golden Goal, which is used in extra time of some tied tournament matches where the first team to score automatically wins. What you may not know is that the Golden Goal was used in the 1998 and 2002 World Cups as an experiment by FIFA to test if teams would be incentivized to attack more in extra time, and only four games were settled by a Golden Goal. Interestingly, in the 2002 World Cup, Senegal won their round of 16 match against Sweden thanks to a Golden Goal, but then lost to Turkey in the quarterfinals also thanks to a Golden Goal. Since 2006, the normal extra time rules of two 15-minute halves have been implemented back into the World Cup. Maracanazo Maracanazo refers to the 1950 World Cup final between Uruguay and Brazil. What's weird about this game is that this match wasn't technically a tournament final. So back in the 1950 tournament, there was no knockout stage. Instead, the winner of each World Cup group got put into another round robin group, with the winner of that group being crowned champion. Due to the results of the previous group stage games, Uruguay needed a win against Brazil to win the World Cup, while Brazil could win or draw and still win the tournament. Brazil were heavy favorites in the match after winning both of their games with a combined 13-2 scoreline, while Uruguay barely squeaked by Sweden and drew with Spain. It also didn't help that the media had already basically declared Brazil the World Cup winners due to their sheer dominance. But after conceding an early second half goal, Uruguay were able to pull ahead with two goals late into the game to win the game and the World Cup 2-1. It remains one of the biggest upsets in World Cup final history. Russian Doping Like the entry suggests, in 2019, the Russian Federation was found guilty of doping among many of their international athletes. As a result, they are banned from the upcoming 2022 World Cup in Qatar. The Mighty Magyars The Mighty Magyars referred to the Hungarian national team during the early 1950s, led by one of the greatest players of all time in Ferenc Puskas. They are considered to be one of, if not the best national teams of all time, and held a record of 42 wins, 7 draws, and only 1 loss. They were involved in many noteworthy games of the early 50s, including the match of the century versus England, and the 1954 World Cup final in which they were upset by West Germany. They dominated international tournaments until 1956, where they were forced to dissolve due to the Hungarian Revolution. Argentina vs Peru 1978 
The 1978 match between Argentina and Peru has long been the subject of controversy due to alleged match fixing. Brazil held the tiebreaker over Argentina in their group, so in order for Argentina to advance to the final, they needed to win by at least 4 goals. It just so happened that Peru collapsed during the second half, and Argentina won 6-0, meaning that they progressed to the final over their bitter rival Brazil, and eventually Argentina would go on to win the World Cup. Many people have come out over the years saying the game was rigged and the governments of both countries agreed to help each other, but no definitive proof has ever been found. There was a lot of controversy surrounding this World Cup in general, which we'll touch on in a little later. El Quinto Partido El Quinto Partido, otherwise known as the Fifth Game Curse, refers to Mexico's inability to make it to the fifth game of the World Cup. Since the 1994 World Cup, Mexico has crashed down the round of 16 for seven consecutive tournaments. It's a source of a lot of national team despair for Mexico and their fans. Maradona Doping Diego Maradona was disqualified and sent home from the 1994 World Cup, his last ever World Cup, after failing a drug test. Maradona claimed that the banned drug was due to a drink his trainer gave him. But I mean, come on, do we really believe that? This is a guy who failed multiple drug tests during his career for cocaine usage, so another doping substance isn't a shock. 2002 South Korea Match Fixing the 2002 World Cup had lots of allegations of match fixing in favor of the host nation South Korea. In particular, their two matches in the round of 16 and the quarterfinals against Italy and Spain are pointed at for their controversial decisions that mainly favored South Korea. This included two goals for Spain that were called off which were generous for the Koreans, and the steady stream of fouls that went unpunished against the Italians. Italy was so infuriated by this game that they cancelled the loan deal of a South Korean player to the Serie A team Perugia. Also, the referee of the South Korea and Italy game was not only suspended later in 2002 for match fixing, but also was apparently caught smuggling heroin in 2010. Roger Mia Roger Mia is a former Cameroonian striker who holds the record for being the oldest goal scorer at a World Cup at 42 years old. He apparently retired from international play in 1988, but the president of Cameroon personally called him and asked him to come out of retirement, so he played in the next two World Cups as a personal favor. He also played professionally in four different decades from the 60s to the 90s, so he's pretty much an all-around legend. Cameroon Jersey 2002 In the 2002 African Cup of Nations, Cameroon and Puma partnered to make a kit that looks more like an old NBA jersey rather than a football kit, but hey, at least it looks pretty cool. FIFA, being FIFA, then banned that jersey because FIFA obviously hates anything that's cool and said the jersey, quote, doesn't fit the standards of an acceptable kit. So, in order to spite FIFA, Cameroon chose to wear a basic black sleeved undershirt on top of the Puma jersey to comply with regulations for the entirety of the 2002 World Cup. Holy Water Scandal During the 1990 World Cup match between rivals Argentina and Brazil, Brazilian defender Branco kept Argentina star Diego Maradona in check, rendering him ineffective for most of the half. However, after a quick pause in play, Branco drank from a water bottle given to him by Argentinian medical staff. He alleged that the drink was spiked, causing him to feel sluggish and unable to contain Maradona, who would go on to assist the winning goal for Argentina. Conspiracists have now dubbed this the holy water scandal due to the alleged drugging. Brazil White Jersey Remember the Maracanazo from the previous tier? Brazil's crushing defeat against an undermatched Uruguay? Guess what color kit Brazil was wearing that day? Yeah, it was the white kit. Brazil famously banned this kit after that match but I've recently brought it back for FIFA's 100th anniversary in 2004 and for the Copa America in 2019. I personally think that the jersey looks super sleek now, but I definitely understand the bad luck associated with it. 1934 World Cup Fixed As this entry suggests, conspiracists believe the 1934 World Cup was fixed as a way to promote fascism and show the power of fascist countries throughout the world. These allegations include the fact that the World Cup was held in Italy which was led by fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, and Italy proceeded to win the tournament, getting some questionable calls and helpful refereeing along the way. It's even alleged that Mussolini handpicked the refs for each Italy game to give them an advantage. 
This Italian team also won the Olympics in 1936 and the World Cup in 1938, so it is difficult to suggest that Italy had or had not won it legitimately when they were obviously very talented. Mario Zagallo Mario Zagallo holds the record for most World Cups won in general of all time. He won the World Cup two times as a player for Brazil in 1958 and 1962, then won as Brazil's manager in 1970, and finally won in 1994 as an assistant coach for Brazil. Josip Simunic 3 Yellow Cards During the 2006 World Cup group stage match between Croatia and Australia, Croatian defender Josip Simunic received 3 yellow cards throughout the match. Obviously, he should have been sent off after the second yellow, but had referee Graham Pohl simply forgot and recorded the infractions incorrectly. According to Pohl, he had mistakenly written the number of Australia's number 3 for the second yellow. Coincidentally, Simunic is Australian born and speaks English with an Australian accent so the mistake is understandable. Regardless, Pohl and his crew did not get placed in the knockout stage crews, and Pohl retired from international refereeing after the tournament. France vs Ireland World Cup Qualifier 2009 France played Ireland in a two-legged knockout tie where the winner would qualify for the 2010 World Cup in South Africa while the loser would be sent home. After the two legs resulted in a tied aggregate score, French attacker Thierry Henry assisted a goal in extra time after controversially handling the ball in order to give France the win and allow them to progress. The entirety of Ireland was enraged. Henry admitted what he did after the match, but nothing could be done as none of the refereeing crew had seen it, and FIFA refused to conduct a replay of the match. Many compared this incident to the Hand of God goal from Tier 2 due to the similar importance of each goal for their respective team. In the end, France would go on to finish dead last in the World Cup group, so maybe some justice was served here? Uruguay for stars Some countries choose to put a star or other emblem on their kit to indicate how many World Cups they have won. Uruguay has four stars on their shirt but have only won two World Cups. The other two come from their gold in the 1924 and 1928 Olympic tournament, the only FIFA recognized senior tournament at the time. So yeah, Uruguay have technically four stars for only two World Cups. Paul the Octopus Paul the Octopus was an octopus from Germany that correctly predicted the winner of 8 games in a row at the 2010 World Cup. He primarily predicted the outcomes for Germany's games as he resided in Germany, even picking against them in the semi-final, which ended up being correct, and correctly predicted that Spain would win the final. Funnily enough, some German fans got so upset with him going against Germany and picking Spain that they called for him to be eaten. And then the Spanish Prime Minister offered protection for Paul to make sure nobody attacked him. Sadly, Paul died in October of 2010. Lucien Laurent Lucien Laurent was a French forward who scored the first ever goal in the World Cup. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any video of the goal, but it was reportedly a 19th minute volley against Mexico. The Battle of Santiago in Ken Aston. Good evening. The game you're about to see is the most stupid, appalling, disgusting and disgraceful exhibition of football possibly in the history of the game. Chile versus Italy. This is the first time the two countries have met. We hope it will be the last. The national motto of Chile reads, by reason or by force. Today, the Chileans were prepared to be reasonable. The Italians only use force. And the result was a disaster for the World Cup. So the 1962 World Cup was held in Chile. And during this World Cup, there is a group stage match between Chile and Italy that took place in Santiago. Before the match, Italian and Chilean journalists were more or less trading shots at each other, with the Italians calling Chile a dump and its population illiterate and handicapped, while Chileans called Italians fascist and egotistical. With the heightened tensions, it only makes sense that during the match between Italy and Chile, there was a lot of violent conduct. Multiple punches and kicks to the body and head occurred, players spat at each other, and there were generally a lot of stoppages because players couldn't keep their cool. Two Italian players were sent off during the match, one within 8 minutes and one before half time, and police intervention was needed at 4 different times. The referee for the match was Ken Aston, who would later go on to develop the yellow card red card system. Aston received a lot of backlash from Italians because he failed to properly send off multiple Chilean players for violent conduct while also putting Italy at a disadvantage early on. There was some speculation of collusion, but ultimately this game goes down as one of the most violent in history. Sweden 1994 
So I originally had no idea about this entry, but after doing a little digging, I think Sweden was simply a pretty cool team to watch that a lot of fans adopted as their fan favorite team during the 1994 World Cup. They ended up placing third overall when they weren't considered one of the strongest teams there, and they won their first World Cup match in 20 years during the tournament. They also were the top scoring team of the tournament with 15 total goals across their 7 matches. This was their golden generation team before Zlatan came along to carry them for most of the 2000s and 2010s, so it's always fun to see the little guy find some success. 1966 World Cup Fixed So yeah, another World Cup got fixed. The 1966 World Cup was held in England and won by, you guessed it, England. How did that happen? Well, multiple matches are the subject of controversy, in particular the quarterfinal match against Argentina and the final against West Germany. In that final, England and West Germany were tied at 2-2 in extra time when England's Jeff Hurst hit a shot off the underside of the crossbar that bounced down and was cleared. The linesman gave the signal that it was a goal, and England would go on to win the final and win their one and only World Cup. Later analysis showed that the ball didn't fully cross the line, and the linesman who signaled for the goal thought he saw the ball hit the back of the net when it clearly didn't. It also doesn't help credibility that the former FIFA president at the time said that the tournament was rigged in England's favor. Turkey 2002 Going into the 2002 World Cup, Turkey was not a big favorite to progress far into the tournament. The Turks made it into the World Cup after a pretty dominant playoff over Austria, but this would be their second ever World Cup. They also got off to a pretty shaky start, only progressing through their group on goal differential after tying Costa Rica in total points. But pretty surprisingly, they managed to beat both host Japan and Senegal in tight 1-0 affairs to reach the semifinals before ultimately being knocked out in a tight contest with tournament winners Brazil. Even so, Turkey managed to place third after beating the other hosts, South Korea, in the third place game 3-2, with Turkish forward Hakan Shukur scoring the fastest ever goal in World Cup history in 10.8 seconds. Serbia and Montenegro 2006 I'm just going to keep this one short and sweet because I don't have enough time to talk about the entirety of the geopolitical conflict in the Balkan states. In short, Serbia and Montenegro used to be a country after the dissolution of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Serbia and Montenegro happened to qualify for the 2006 World Cup after topping its qualifying group and only allowing one goal in its 10 qualifying matches. On June 3, 2006, a mere six days before the World Cup started, Montenegro voted in a referendum to declare independence from Serbia, and thus the nation of Serbia and Montenegro no longer existed. Obviously, FIFA was not given a heads up about the referendum and did not have enough time to figure out how to handle the situation, so they instead declared that the team that qualified would have to play, resulting in Serbia and Montenegro representing a country that no longer existed in the world. What's funny is that only one Montenegrin player was actually on the World Cup roster. So the team was basically Serbia with some guy they kind of picked up in Montenegro on the way over. In a sad ending to this story, Serbia and Montenegro crashed out in the group stage and dead last with no points picked up, conceding 10 goals in the process, the most out of any team in the group stage. Bogota Bracelet In preparation for the 1970 World Cup in Mexico, England planned to play two matches in high altitude conditions to physically prepare for the demanding matches in Mexico. Near the hotel in Bogota, Colombia, where the team was staying, was a jewelry store, and on the night of arrival, English defender Bobby Moore, as well as a few of his England teammates, went to browse the store for gifts. Allegedly, Moore and English forward Bobby Charlton looked at the items, but didn't find any jewelry they liked, and left. On their way out, a shop worker alleged that Moore stole a bracelet. Moore denied any wrongdoing, police took statements, and Moore was released as there was no evidence of his crime. Fast forward a couple days, England had just finished a match against Ecuador, and the team were waiting in their hotel for their connecting flight to Mexico City. While waiting, two Colombian police in plain clothes arrested Moore and formally charged him with theft. Over the next few days, Moore was interrogated by the police and kept under house arrest while witnesses provided less than concrete testimonies. It didn't help that the key accuser changed her story multiple times, and another key witness waited until four days after the arrest to come forward with his story. Ultimately, on May 28, 1970, Moore was set free after the judge determined there was insufficient evidence and returned to the England camp in Mexico City for the World Cup. Mussolini Threats Benito Mussolini, big man, fascist dictator, not too popular nowadays. 
But back in 1938, he was still in power and was a big influence in the fascist undertones of the Italian national teams. After the fascist propaganda machine that was the 1934 World Cup in Italy, Mussolini again put his hands into the Italian national team, having them do fascist salutes and gestures before games and giving them black kids to wear. However, this entry ties into the alleged threats Mussolini made to the team before their 1938 final against Hungary. Mussolini had allegedly sent the team a telegram that in English simply stated, win or die. Now, whether this was literally or figuratively, we may never know, as Italy went on to win the final. But there is no doubt that Mussolini was very influential in the early days of the World Cup in its match fixing. 2010 North Korean Fans And perhaps one of the crazier recent World Cup stories, North Korea managed to qualify for the 2010 World Cup in South Africa. Now, for a country like North Korea to qualify for such a large tournament, there may be questions about the fan presence. But no, North Korea brought in a strong group of 300 hand-selected citizens to wear the same supporters uniform, sing the national anthem with pride, and cheer when a conductor told them to. Yeah, it was a little odd to say the least. It didn't help that North Korea had been allocated 1,400 supporter seats, so most of these tickets went to Chinese fans who were willing to support North Korea to watch the games for basically nothing. You know, now that I'm thinking about it, it probably was a good thing that hardly any North Korean fans showed up, as the team finished dead last in their group, scoring only one goal while conceding 12. Nineteen fifty four Germany doping. So when I covered the Mighty Magyars in Tier three, I mentioned that they lost the nineteen fifty four World Cup final to West Germany. This match is known as one of the greatest upsets in international history, as again, Hungary was in its golden generation of players, while West Germany was still trying to collect the pieces after World War II. After the match, numerous rumors came out that the West German team had been given performance enhancing drugs before the match. Several members of the team fell ill after the match, but the team doctor insisted that he had only given them vitamin C. In 2010, Researchers at Humboldt University in Berlin released a study concluding that the team might have been given pervitin, a drug similar to methamphetamine. Further evidence points to the fact that pervitin was commonly used as a stimulant by German soldiers in World War II. It didn't really matter at the time, as no anti-doping policies had been put into place by FIFA yet, but it always adds to the myth behind this match. Bellini Trophy Lift Hilderaldo Luis Bellini is a former Brazilian defender who is credited for being the first person to lift the World Cup trophy out over his head as a form of celebration. Reportedly, he wanted to lift the trophy high so that the photographers could get a better view to capture their winning image. After the photo went viral, more and more players adopted it, and it is now one of the more iconic celebrations in all of sports. Colombia hosts in 1986. The 1986 World Cup held in Mexico was actually originally supposed to be held in Colombia. FIFA had originally given Colombia the bid in 1974, a time when the tournament only held 16 teams. However, during the 1982 World Cup, FIFA expanded the tournament to 24 teams. Colombia, already in a tricky financial state, was able to afford the tournament of 16 teams but could not afford the newly expanded field and were forced to withdraw their bid for the World Cup with the spot eventually going to Mexico controversially. Brazil vs Chile World Cup Qualifier 1989 In the qualifying stages of the 1990 World Cup, Brazil and Chile were set to face off for a winner-take-all match to progress to the cup. Brazil scored the only goal of the game in the 49th minute, but that's not what this game is known for. In the 67th minute, a flare was thrown onto the pitch from the Brazilian fans that appeared to hit Chilean goalkeeper Roberto Rojas. Rojas was immediately treated by doctors, and the Chilean team left the field in protest. Also, Chilean forward Patricio Yanez did this to the Brazilian fans, as if they weren't riled up already. The next day, photos and videos came forward showing that the flare never actually hit Rojas, and he had no signs of burning or gunpowder residue on his injury. When later questioned, Rojas revealed that he had in fact not been hit, instead cut himself with a razor blade hidden in his gloves to fake an attack. He also stated that the Chilean head coach, Orlando Aravena, had personally told him and the doctor to stay on the pitch as long as possible to either force a replay 
or get Brazil disqualified. Ten days later, FIFA banned Rojas from professional football, gave punishment to Aravena and other team members involved, and not only gave Brazil the win, but banned Chile from the 1994 World Cup qualifiers as well. But hey, at least Chile won the best moment of the match. Romania 1994 I think Romania 1994 is just another one of those really cool teams that happen to be pretty memorable. The Romanian national team was surprisingly very good at the time given the instability in the prior 10 years, and many of their golden generational players like midfielder George Haji and forward Florin Raducoșu played throughout Europe on notable teams. The Romanian team in the 1994 World Cup got off to a good start after topping their group, but they are most famous for their big upset over Argentina in what would be Diego Maradona's final World Cup. Unfortunately, the golden generation of Romania would go out in the quarterfinals after a penalty shootout to that Sweden team from Tier 5. It remains their best ever placement at a World Cup. 1982 World Cup Draw So the 1982 World Cup draw was full of mishaps and can best be described as a disastrous dumpster fire of a draw. To begin, during the seeding process for each pot, FIFA chose to put England, a team that had barely qualified for this World Cup and had missed the previous two, into the highest pot, indicating they were one of the strongest teams at the tournament when clearly people could tell they weren't. Fortunately or unfortunately, FIFA didn't have to deal with this controversy for too long. During the live drawing ceremony, FIFA president Sepp Blatter had forgotten the only stipulation of the draw, that only one South American team could be in a group. When drawing for pot B, the pot containing the two South American teams that hadn't been placed, Belgium was first selected and was supposed to be placed in Group 3, which contained Argentina, but was accidentally placed in Group 1. The next team picked, Scotland, was then placed into Group 3. Realizing their mistake, FIFA had to apologize and place Belgium into Group 3 and Scotland into Group 6. Not only this, but one of the rotating drums used to pick the balls for group selection malfunctioned and needed to be fixed to release the balls. Just an all-around unfortunate draw. USA vs England 1950 So this match is widely considered one of the greatest upsets in modern international football. England were pretty heavy favorites in the 1950 World Cup after a 23-3-4 record after World War II, while the Americans had been outscored in their previous seven international games 45-2. It also didn't help that England had a team of actual professional players, while the American side was mainly players who played part-time and who held a second job. Three of the players on the American side weren't even American. They were added last second to fill the roster requirements on the stipulation that they would eventually receive citizenship. American coach Bill Jeffrey confidently said that they had no chance and that they were sheep ready to be slaughtered. Despite this, the US scored the only goal of the game in the 38th minute by one of those replacement players, Joe Gatians, who I'll talk about later in the iceberg. This match was so harmful for the English that they banned wearing their blue kit forever, and it would eventually be cited by the English FA as a cause for its reorganization in the late 50s. Both teams would go on to crash out in the group stage, but this match was still such an insane upset. Bulgaria 1994 So Bulgaria was again another one of those pretty cool teams in their golden generation during the 1994 World Cup, along with Romania and Sweden. They were led by their prolific striker Hristo Shoichkov, one of the greatest strikers of all time who would go on to win the golden boot in the tournament. They also defied the odds a bit relative to their projected ranking. They came into the tournament ranked 29th in the world, so there wasn't much of an expectation that they would go too far. However, they ended up placing second in their group and beating Mexico and Germany in the round of 16 and quarterfinals before losing to a very good Italy team in the semifinals. They did get obliterated 4-0 by Sweden in the third place game, but still, they were a pretty memorable team. Gary Lineker Accident <laughs> Yeah, if you know anything about England football in the 90s, you probably know about this. In the 1990 World Cup opening match between England and Ireland, English striker Gary Lineker kinda, sorta, shat himself on the pitch. Now, the story behind the situation is even sadder than the incident suggests. According to Lineker himself, the night before the match, he had experienced cramping and diarrhea and woke up on match day to the same feelings. Lineker, a player who never wanted to shy away from the match, purposefully didn't tell his manager that he was feeling ill so he could be put on the team sheet. Once the game started, Lineker was able to manage his way through the first half without too much cramping, but once he went for that challenge in the second half, 
He wasn't able to hold in the cramps anymore, and he let himself go. The sad ending to the story is that Lineker was subbed off after this incident, and wasn't even allowed to go relieve himself since the tunnels to the bathrooms were on the opposite side of the pitch, so he had to sit on the bench alone as nobody wanted to sit next to him. Sheikh Fahad Alamad Al Sabah. Sheikh Fahad Alamad Al Sabah is a former Kuwaiti military officer and a founder of the Kuwait Olympic Committee and Asian Handball Federation. He is also a member of the Sabah family, the ruling family over Kuwait. During the 1982 World Cup match between France and Kuwait, France scored a controversial fourth goal after Kuwaiti players claimed that they had heard a whistle and stopped playing, leading to the easy goal. Al Sabah was in attendance at this game and actually walked onto the field before the match resumed to protest the call with the referee. He actually convinced the referee to overturn the call in one of the most unprecedented events in the World Cup ever. He did go on to express his apologies eight years later, but this remains as one of the most bizarre refereeing decisions of the game. Jules Rimet Speech 1950 So way back in Tier 3, I talked about the Maracanazo, which was one of the biggest upsets in World Cup history, with heavy favorites Brazil losing to Uruguay 2-1. Now, it wasn't just the media that were heavily favoring Brazil in this. Even FIFA President Jules Rimet was so confident in a Brazil victory that he prepared only one victory speech specifically for Brazil in Portuguese for when he would hand them the trophy. Well, that didn't really work out, so instead of having this big speech ready for the winners, he sort of just stood there and gave the trophy to Uruguay silently. Batistone Collision Just wonder what the uh, referee thought about the challenge from Schumacher on Batistone. In the 1982 World Cup semi-final between France and West Germany, West German goalkeeper Harold Schumacher collided with French defender Patrick Batiston on a breakaway around the 60th minute of the match. The resulting collision of Schumacher's hip to Batiston's face resulted in Batiston being knocked unconscious and having three cracked ribs, damaged vertebrae, and two missing teeth. Batiston's teammate Michel Platini would later go on to say he thought Batiston was dead because he was pale and had no pulse. Dutch referee Charles Korver declined to even call a foul on this play, let alone give Schumacher a card or send him off. This challenge is widely considered one of the most dangerous challenges in all of World Cup history. India 1950 If you know anything about Indian football, you know that they aren't really that good. I mean, come on, they are so bad that they are the only team to consistently have a one-star rating in FIFA, the worst out of any playable team. But in the early days of football, India wasn't half bad. They played a lot of friendly matches against clubs around Europe and Australia and even competed in the 1948 Olympics. They were able to qualify for the 1950 World Cup not because they won their qualification process, but because all of their opponents forfeited, leaving them winners by default. After the World Cup draw, India also decided to withdraw from the competition, citing issues with team selection, practice times, and travel costs, among others. The big conspiracy around this decision to withdraw actually revolves around India's decision to play barefoot in the early days of the game. FIFA had recently made a rule that all international play must be played with shoes, yet India normally played barefoot or with wraps around their feet. India has denied this rumor over the years, but many of their reasons for withdrawing have already been debunked. For example, FIFA offered to pay for the flight and team hotel for India during the tournament, so the cost shouldn't have been a factor. Regardless. Since 1950, India has yet to come close to achieving another World Cup qualification spot. 1930 Final Balls During the first ever World Cup final between Uruguay and Argentina, there is reportedly a disagreement between who should provide the official match ball for the game. Eventually, both teams and FIFA came to a compromise where Argentina would provide the ball for the first half and Uruguay would provide the ball for the second half, the only time this has ever occurred in World Cup final history. Argentina, funnily enough, was winning at halftime after using their own ball, but went on to lose 4-2 after using Uruguay's ball in the second. The Disgrace of Guillon The Disgrace of Guillon was a 1982 World Cup group stage match between West Germany and Austria. Prior to the match, group members Algeria were coming off a surprise World Cup run and had situated themselves in a good position to get to the next round. Only a West Germany win by one or two goals would see Algeria fail to progress and West Germany and Austria go through. 
Well, after West Germany scored an early goal to make it 1-0, the rest of the game was dominated with a display of passing and lackluster attack. Many Algerian fans in attendance started chants of match fixing, and both the West German and Austrian commentators urged their viewers to stop watching and refused to commentate at some points. Due to this scoreline, West Germany and Austria progressed in first and second, while Algeria were eliminated. As a result of this match, all final group stage games from the 1986 World Cup and onwards will be played at the same time to avoid potential max fixing scandals. Iran vs Bahrain World Cup Qualifier 2001 Throughout the Middle Eastern World Cup qualifiers, few rivalries are able to compare to the rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia. For a variety of political, religious, and sporting power reasons, both nations always have intense matches in an attempt to show their strength over the other. So in the 2001 World Cup qualifiers, when both teams were drawn in the same group and Iran had the chance to qualify to the World Cup on the final day over Saudi Arabia, Iran had all the motivation to give it all on the field. The only problem was that they were facing the Bahrain side, who also did not like Iran. In a hard-fought battle, Bahrain, who had nothing to play for besides pride, beat Iran 3-1, spoiling their chance to top the group and giving Saudi Arabia the top spot. To add insult to injury, the Bahraini players were seen celebrating with the Saudi Arabian flag after their victory, rubbing salt into the wound for the Iranian players. Luis Monti Luis Monti was a former midfielder in the 1920s and 1930s who holds the honor of being the only person to compete in two different World Cups with two different national teams. So if you didn't know, once you have been called up for your senior national team, you can only switch national teams if you have only played in senior level friendly matches and have citizenship in the country you want to switch to. However, in the early days of international play, this wasn't necessarily the case. Luis Monti was officially born in Argentina and played the first ever World Cup in 1930 for Argentina. In 1931, he moved to Italian club Juventus as he had Italian citizenship due to his ancestry, and his strong play got him a call up to the Italian national team as an oriundo, which were athletes who were born in foreign countries but had strong ancestral ties to Italy. He is also the only player to play in both of the first two World Cup finals, losing the first final with Argentina against Uruguay and winning the second final with Italy against Czechoslovakia. North Korea Champions Hoax so we all know North Korea isn't the most free country in the world, so there have been a lot of stories and reports about how North Koreans must have propaganda that they won the World Cup numerous times in a show of North Korean superiority. There was a fake video that appeared online in 2014 about North Korea reportedly being told they won the World Cup in Brazil, and paintings have appeared showing North Korea competing in the 1966 and 2010 World Cup Finals, the only two World Cups they've appeared in. However. These hoaxes have been debunked, and reportedly North Koreans have taken great pride in their ability to even reach the World Cup and compete with the top national teams, with players often being regarded as national heroes. The Curse of Tilcara Before their 1986 World Cup run in Mexico, the Argentinian national team spent time training in Tilcara, Argentina in order to get acclimated to the high altitudes they would have to play in in Mexico. During this trip, the Argentinian team promised they would return to Tilcara and visit the town's Virgin Mary should they win the World Cup. Well, Argentina did end up winning the World Cup, however they never returned back to Tilcara with the trophy. Since then, a supposed religious curse has been placed on Argentina that prevents them from ever winning the World Cup until the trophy returns to Tilcara. Famous examples of this curse being enacted is the 1990 World Cup Final against West Germany, the 2014 World Cup Final against Germany again, and the disastrous group stage exit in the 2002 World Cup. There was a documentary made about the situation called the Curse of Tilcara, where the trophy was brought back to the town, so maybe the curse is lifted now? I guess we'll see in the upcoming World Cup. Joe Gagans So I talked about Joe Gagans in Tier 6, but if you don't remember, he was the person who scored the only goal in the 1950 match between the US and England. Now, he wasn't actually American. He was born and raised in Haiti, and only played for the US because he played professional soccer while at Columbia University in New York City, and US scouts saw how good he was, so they just kinda let him play for the team under the intention that he would become a US citizen soon. He has a really crazy life story. His family was actually pretty well known in the Haitian political scene. 
When Francois Duvalier declared himself president for life of Haiti in 1964, most of Gayen's family fled the island since his brothers were rebel leaders against Duvalier. But Joe stayed thinking he wouldn't be harmed since he was pretty neutral and just a sports figure. That same morning, he was arrested by the Haitian secret police, taken to a prison, and presumably executed. Gayens would later be inducted in the US Soccer Hall of Fame and is cited as one of the heroes of the World Cup, wrapping up a pretty interesting legacy. 1998 Terrorist Plot During the months leading up to the 1998 World Cup in France, European law enforcement uncovered a massive terrorist plot that would have been enacted on the event. Various potential attacks included the England vs Tunisia match, the infiltration of the Stade Velodrome to attack players and spectators including young stars like David Beckham and Michael Owen, bombing the US team hotel, and hijacking a plane and crashing it into a French nuclear power facility. The plot was organized by the Algerian armed Islamic group and potentially financed by Osama bin Laden in a pushback against western ideology. Over 100 people were arrested across 7 different countries in connection to the plot. As a consequence of this, Al-Qaeda and the Algerian armed Islamic group set up dormant networks that led to further attacks in 1998 and beyond, including plots at Euro 2000 and in French national team matches. Johan Cruyff misses the 1978 World Cup Johan Cruyff, one of the greatest footballers of all time, was the subject of speculation during the 1978 World Cup, as he was notably absent from the Dutch national squad. At the time, many believed that Cruyff didn't want to be used as a propaganda piece for the Argentinian government. In 2008, however, Cruyff revealed that the main reason he was absent was a kidnapping that occurred at his home in Barcelona the year prior. Cruyff, his wife, and his kids were all tied up and held at gunpoint by kidnappers, but were able to somehow escape. As expected, this ordeal really shook Cruyff up, and he decided that he wasn't 200% ready to leave his family for such a long time and commit to the World Cup. Andreas Escobar Marler, This morning in Medellin Den, Colombia, World Cup soccer fans took that about a million steps further. On June 22nd in Pasadena's Rose Bowl, the U.S. won a 2-1 game in which Colombia defender Andres Escobar accidentally kicked the ball into his own net. Colombia, one of the favorites going in, was eliminated in the first round. The team returned home on Wednesday to anonymous threats, threats that were carried out. Andres Escobar was a former Colombian defender widely regarded as one of the best South American defenders of his generation. He made over 200 appearances for Colombian club Atlético Nacional and over 50 appearances for the Colombian national team. In the 1994 World Cup group stage match versus the United States, Escobar tried to block an oncoming cross and unfortunately headed into his own net for an own goal. The US would go on to win this game 2-1. This loss ultimately proved costly as Colombia crashed out in last place during the group stage. Five days after returning home from the World Cup, Escobar and some friends went on a night out drinking and go into the clubs. At around 3 a.m. that morning, Escobar had split with his friends and was sitting in his car when three men approached him. After an argument between two parties, two of the men pulled out handguns and shot Escobar six times, yelling goal after each shot in an attempt to mimic the Colombian commentator after Escobar's own goal. The men fled, and Escobar was taken to a local hospital before succumbing to his injuries 45 minutes later. More than 120,000 people attended Escobar's funeral, and still to this day, people all around Colombia continue to honor him for the good work and positive image he brought to the country. Conspiration 58 Conspiration 58 is a mockumentary film made in 2002 that alleges that the 1958 World Cup in Sweden did not actually happen at all, and was a fake radio and television broadcast as part of a broad conspiracy between the United States, Sweden, FIFA, and the CIA. Evidence of this conspiracy includes Sweden's inability to provide enough economical and technical resources to support such an event, houses in the background of matches not existing, and the shadows of players being at weird angles with the corresponding sun position. The film reveals itself to be fake at the end, but many audience members at the premiere did not know this was fake until this final reveal. You can find the movie online if you're interested. Matthias Sindelar and Alexandre Viaplan for the final entry on the iceberg, we have a tale of two players who happen to be on opposite sides of history. Matthias Sindelar was an Austrian forward who was one of the best strikers in the early years of European and international football. Off the back of Sindelar's great play, Austria were able to qualify for the 1934 World Cup and ended up placing fourth, the second highest placement of all time in the World Cup for the Austrian national team. Further west, North African-born French midfielder Alexandre Viaplan and the French national team were able to qualify for the first ever World Cup in 1930, crashing out in the group stage. 
Viaplan was a decent enough midfielder, but never really had that internal desire to push himself like Sindelar had. While Sindelar was having strong years for his club and country, Viaplan was involved in an early match-fixing scandal that ended up forcing him to retire from professional play. As the 1930s dragged on in Europe, Nazi influence continued to spread throughout all European nations. After the annexation of Austria in 1938, Sindelar refused to play for the German national team, citing old age and health concerns. But his actual motivation could have been his opposition to Nazism and the German Reich. Several months later, in January of 1939, Sindelar and his girlfriend were found dead in their home due to carbon monoxide poisoning. But some believe he was secretly killed by the Nazi Gestapo due to his opposition to the cause. In France, Viaplan had become a notorious underground criminal in the French black market. As the Nazis moved into occupied France, Viaplan took a role in the French Carline Gestapo forces operating in France and North Africa. Viaplan eventually was able to earn SS honors for his work and was a major contributor in the execution of French resistance members throughout 1943 and 1944. Viaplan was eventually arrested and sentenced to death for his involvement with the Carline, and he was executed by firing squad on December 26, 1944. And that is it. Honestly, when I first started this, I never expected the iceberg to be as captivating as it was. There are so many entries on here that I had no idea about, even though I've been around the sport for most of my life. Big thanks once again to VJNI for putting this iceberg together. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and comment down below. It really means a lot to me. Other than that, it's been Cobra. Peace out. Thank you.